good start. Okay, okay, sir. Good afternoon, all. Good afternoon, all. Distinguished guest of the day, Professor Prabhat Patnaik, the president of the meeting and principal of the college, Dr. Vagis Matthew, the moderator of this academic session, Dr. Abraham George, respected former teachers of the department and the college, faculty members of the college and the department, faculty members from various colleges, all other distinguished guests, research scholars and students. We wholeheartedly welcome you all to the special occasion of Silver Jubilee edition of annual lecture of the Department of Economics, Mathoma College, Thiruvalla. The annual lecture is a prestigious academic event of the department, which started in the year 1998, when the department got recognized as a research center of the Mahatma Gandhi University. For the last 24 years, the department was able to organize this event in a meaningful and fruitful manner. Over these years, the department arranged lectures by eminent scholars in economics, both from within the country and outside. We take this time to express our gratitude to all those who have contributed in this successful journey, especially former principals of the college, former faculty members, and all former students of the department. Once again, I welcome you all to the 25th annual lecture of the Department of Economics, Martoma College, Thiruvalla. A moment of gratitude makes a difference in our attitude. Let us be thankful to the Almighty for strengthening us to conduct the program all through these years and for keeping us all safe in these troubling times. Now, Ms. Jenna John of 3rd BA Economics will lead us in prayer with a prayer song. Akela chara chara rekshaka deva Akamari nyangale pali ke deva Arala geniki ananda megi Sakala sauba yangale ke nam nada Sakala sauba yangale ke nam nada Krishnanam Krishnuvum Malayum Nii Nistula Sneha Nilayavum Nii Srishtiyum Dekshayum Samharam Evum Ishta Swarubani Nila Vilasam Akila Chara Chara Rekshaka Deva Agamari nyangale pali ke deva Arala geniki Ananda meki Sakala saupa yangale ke nam nada Sakala saupa yangale ke nam nada Thank you, Jenna. Now, I invite Mr. Anup Koshi George, Assistant Professor of the Department, to deliver his welcome address. The respected guest for the day, Professor Dr. Prabhat Pardai, the President of this meeting, and the College Principal, Dr. Rogis Matthew, Moderator of this academic session, and the former Principal of the College, Dr. Abraham George, faculty members of various colleges, former principals and former faculty members of the college, faculty members of the college and the department, research scholars of the department, and dear students. Good afternoon, all. This is a proud occasion for the Department of Economics, Margama College, Thiruvala. The department which started its journey at the time of inception of the college in 1952 is achieving yet another milestone in its journey. It is definitely a privilege for the department to be able to conduct the Silver Jubilee edition of annual lecture when the college is in its 70th year. To celebrate the occasion of Silver Jubilee edition of the annual lecture, the department has organized a national level paper presentation competition for UG and PG students. Here, we are in an unprecedented times. Two years back, we were on the verge of the global shutdown. 
and the world economy has still not fully recovered from it. As the crisis is always seen as a time of new experiments, the governments, institutions, and individuals all over the world have been devising strategies to deal not only with the pandemic, but also strategize a paradigm shift in the economic policies. Three decades back, our country has initiated such a policy that paves the way for opening up the economy into a liberalized era. At this juncture of the completion of 30 years of its initiation, the pandemic has brought in an opportunity to strengthen these economic policies. Economic growth, which these market-oriented economic policies have brought in, can never be ignored. At the same time, it is important to look into the social and economic inequalities that have been arousing over these years. The latest addition to this stream of inequalities is the digital divide, which has become evident through the pandemic particularly in the education sector. With this broad view of mine, let me come to the responsibility entrusted with me today. It is indeed an honor for me to offer words of welcome to each one of you who have done who have gathered here for the 25th annual lecture of the department. The meeting is presided over by Dr. Vogis Matthew, the principal of the college. Sir took the responsibility of the college back in June 2020, when the whole world was in a great crisis. Last two years was really a tough time, especially for educational institutions. It is his commitment and leadership skills that ensured the progress of the institution amidst challenges. He always guides us and develops enthusiasm in us to be excellent. So in spite of his busy schedule, always ensure his presence and support in all activities of the department. Thank you, sir, for presiding over this meeting. On the behalf of everyone present, I welcome Dr. Vogis Matthew, the college to the 25th annual lecture of the department. Good night a renowned economist who needs not much introduction. When we invited Sir for the first, first edition of the online lecture series in 2020, Sir gave an assurance that he will definitely be a part of an important event of the department sometime soon. Department is so honored by the presence of this eminent scholar in economics in this special occasion. His contribution to the society can't be limited to the numerous publications, including internationally acclaimed articles and books. Professor Van Eyck always tried to relate his thoughts and ideas for the benefit of common man. He never hesitates to write and comment on the crucial issues that arise in economic as well as social sphere. Professor Van Eyck is so dear to all Kerlites as he was a vice chairman of the Kerala State Planning Board from 2006 till 2011. He was the chairman of the Second State Finance Commission. So thank you for accepting our invite invitation in spite of the busy schedule and for choosing the most significant topic, growth and poverty under neoliberalism for today's lecture. Over the past few months, the department has conducted some discussions on the theme, three decades of economic reforms. We are very sure that today's lecture will give us all deeper and broader insights about the implications the neoliberal reforms had on the economy. On behalf of everyone gathered, I extend a very warm welcome to the distinguished guest, Professor Dr. Prabhat Patnaik, to the Silver Jubilee edition of the annual lecture. Dr. Abraham George, Director of Research Institute for Sustainable Development and Governance, Quantum, is the moderator of today's event. Sir is more dear to us being the former head of the department and former principal of the college. It is his enthusiasm and leadership as head of the department which strengthened the position of the department as a research center of Mahatma Gandhi University for 
We look up to him with gratitude for initiating an event, the annual lecture, which is now in its 25th year. Thank you, sir, for all your support, guidance, motivation, and encouragement all throughout these years, and especially for being the moderator of the On behalf of everyone present here, I extend a very warm welcome to Dr. Edmund Joseph. I take this time to express our sincere gratitude to all former faculty members and former heads of the department for all their contributions and initiatives. At this time, I sincerely acknowledge the contributions of Professor P.M. Thomas, the first head of the department, late Professor Jacob Kudian, Professor T.K. George Whiten, Professor C.V. Verbis, Professor M.P. Philip, Professor Remini George, Professor Mary Human, Professor Cherian Verbis, Professor Susan Sheila Jacob, Dr. George Matthew, Professor A.B. Thomas, and Dr. I.C. K. John. Thank you all dear teachers. They are here with us today on this special occasion. I extend a wholehearted welcome to each one of them. The present head of the department, Professor Reggie Matthew, is a man with real commitment and passion for teaching. We are so fortunate to have served as our leader. It is his enthusiasm that made this event a reality. On behalf of everyone present, I extend a very warm welcome to Professor Reggie Matthew. I extend a very warm welcome to all former principals and, for, and faculty members of the college who are here with us today. I also welcome the, fact, the former faculty members of the college and the faculty members of the department and faculty members from near and far who has joined with us today. This all, I also welcome all research scholars of the department, well-wishers and all students of the department to this special occasion. We have participants for this event from different places. I extend a very warm welcome to each one of you who have taken time to be with us today. I hope this academic initiative would continue its journey in the years to come. Wish you all a meaningful and a fruitful academic section. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Our beloved principal, Dr. Vergis Matthew, sir, has always been a source of encouragement and support for all activities of the department. We always find time to be with us for all activities. His presence, motivating words, is so valuable. So thank you for your presence and for presiding over the meeting. I humbly invite respected Dr. Vergis Matthew, sir, the principal of the college, for the presidential address. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Chief guest of the day, Professor Dr. Prabhat Parnaik, famous Indian economist. Today's moderator, Dr. Abraham George, Director of Research Institute for Sustainable Development and Governance, and former principal, Martha Mukul Tirivella, Dr. ICK John, former principal, Martha Mukul Tirivella, Professor Raji Matthew, Lecturer of Economics, Convenience of today's lecture, Professor Anukoshi George, Professor Arvind Shankar, Mr. George Thomas, Secretary Economics Association, former faculty of the department, teachers of the department, research colleagues, and my dear students. Greetings from Martha Makode Thiruvel. I congratulate the HOD, Professor Rajiv Matthew, and the convenience for organizing the Silver Jubilee edition of annual lecture series of the department. Established in the year 1952, the Martha is one of the first NAC accredited colleges in India. In all the four cycles of NAC accreditation, the college got A grade. Also, the college got 80th position in All India NIRF 2021 ranking. Very happy to say that the college is in its 70th year of its inspection, and the various departments have been conducting several activities in this special year. Department of Economics is one of the best departments in this college. The department offers UG, PG, doctoral and certificate programs. It is an active research department and produced several PhDs. Every year, the department conducts annual lecture on relevant topics. It is a fact that the Department of Economics is conducting its 25th edition of annual lecture series along with the Sapadi celebration of the college. So this day is a special for the institution and the department. For the past 24 years, several economists and experts in related fields have delivered annual 
lectures of the department. The first lecture was delivered by Dr. Samuel Paul, senior economist, World Bank. Later, he was awarded with the Padma Sri in the year 2004. The annual lectures have inspired several teachers, research scholars, and students. Also, department level discussions were carried out based on the delivered topics. To deliver the 25th annual lecture, we have with us today. Today's guest of honor, also Dr. Prabhat Patnaik, famous Indian economist. In this auspicious day, we have blessed with one of the most simple and differential economists in India. Martha Tirivella is lucky to have the presence of the former vice chairman of Kerala State Planning Board and a distinguished former professor of Jawaharlal Nehru University. A specialist in macroeconomics and political economy, Sayer's presence is an added advantage to the department and the college. We are very happy that Prabhat Pandaik sir is with us to deliver the 25th annual lecture on the topic, Growth and Poverty under Neoliberalism. On behalf of Martha Kauli Fraternity, I sincerely welcome you, sir, to Martha Makoli Thiruvanna. Also, I'm very happy that former principal of the college, Dr. Abraham Chow, sir, is with us. He is the moderator of this annual lecture. I welcome you, sir, to the college. We have been witnessing the impact of COVID-19 pandemic during the last two years. The restrictions of the pandemic have drastically affected the economy of all countries, and it, affect, and it affected all sectors of the world. In this context, the title of the lecture is very apt and relevant. The COVID-19 pandemic has exposed the toxic effects of neoliberalism. Neoliberalism is an economic ideology of capitalism, has depleted our public services, turned our education and health care into profit-driven businesses, hoarded profits at the expense of undervalued and underpaid workers. It has been generating poverty divisions between people and countries. COVID-19 pandemic revealed that only public institutions or government-funded agencies can support the people in their needs, especially during pandemic and wild situations. Let the discussions and deliberations in this lecture may give some new, some, some new sites. What measures can be taken to eradicate poverty and ensure growth among all sectors of society? Let me say one thing to students. For a change, one must need good education and aid. Education makes a door to bright, to bright future. A brighter future starts with an education. Education is self-empowerment. To get good education, one must listen to lectures and classes of eminent personalities. So listen to this lecture with utmost care and be a part of the history of the department. Let this annual lecture, his, deli his, his deliberations may help all you to sharpen your knowledge and skills. Let me conclude. I wish all success for this honor lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for the presidential. Head of the department, Mr. Reggie Matthew, is always there at the forefront for initiating all activities of the department. A person with utmost commitment and dedication. The department is fortunate to have him as the leader. With all respect, I invite Arjisar for his remarks. Most respected chief guest of the day, Professor Prabhat Pranayak sir, President of this meeting and uh, the principal of the college, Dr. Varghis Mati sir, moderator of this academic session, Dr. Abraham Jor sir, respected former teachers, former principals, teachers from other departments of the college, teachers from neighboring colleges, non-teaching staff, research scholars, and my beloved students. Good afternoon, good afternoon, one and all. This is a very happy occasion in the history of the Department of Economics of Martha Macaulay Thiruvilla. And it had a very humble beginning with the starting of 
undergraduate courses in 1955. And in 1981, the postgraduate course it was started. And in 1998, the department has been upgraded to a research center. And it is, and it is one of the best research centers coming under Mahatma University Kotte. Currently, there are 200 students under the UG and PG streams and six faculty members. There are 25 research scholars and four supervising teachers. And in 1997-98, the annual lecture was started. And today, the department is celebrating the 25th year. In 1997, Dr. Shomel Paul, who was the senior economist of World Bank, delivered the first lecture. And today, on this Jubilee year, the annual lecture is going to be delivered by an eminent economist of the country, Professor Prabhat Pranayak sir. So it is a really honor on this special occasion to have Professor Prabhat Pranayak sir as our chief guest on behalf of the entire Department of Economics of Martha Mukhole Thiruvalla. Once again, a very warm welcome to Professor Prabhat Pranayak sir. I also take this opportunity to express our sincere gratitude to Professor Prabhat Pranayak sir for accepting our humble request and delivering a lecture on a very relevant topic like growth and poverty under neoliberalism. Special thanks to Dr. Abraham George sir for being the moderator of this academic session. And I think that he's the right person to be the moderator on this special occasion. It was Dr. Abraham George sir who took all the initiative in starting the annual lecture in 1997-98 when he was the HOD of the Department of Economics. He is the former principal of the college and also the former HOD of the Department of Economics. And currently, the director of Research Institute for Sustainable Development and Governance, Rwanda. I also remember with the respect and gratitude all my beloved former teachers of the department. Professor P.M. Thomas sir, Professor George Vaidyan sir, Professor C.V. Varghi sir, late Professor Jack Gurian sir, Professor M.B. Philip sir, Dr. Abraham George sir, Professor Ramani George teacher, Professor Major Human teacher, Professor Cherian Varghi sir, Professor Susan Sheila Jacob teacher, Dr. George Mathis sir, Professor Ravi Thomas sir, and Dr. I.C. Kajan sir. We acknowledge your precious contributions to the Department of Economics. And I welcome you all to this academic session. Thanks to the principal of the college, Dr. Varis Matisar. He's always a great support to the Department of Economics. and an able leader who can feel the pulse of both the teaching and the student community. Dear students, you are, real, you are the real strength of this department of, and of any institution. And you are so lucky that 
now you can listen to an eminent economist of the country and i just ask you to effectively utilize this time i would like to thank mr anup koshi george who is the convener of this program for doing everything in an excellent manner i also thank the entire department team for supporting the convener in presenting everything in a good manner i also welcome once again welcome all those are present on the other end of this program and i want to conclude with these words thank you thank you irji sir the words fall music speaks it is the universal language of mankind let's give it up for mr josh thomas of third ba economics hello hello നീലമിഴി കൊണ്ടു നീ മെല്ലെ മൊഴിയുമ്പോ നിന്നിലൊരു തെന്നല താനെ അലിയും നീതാ നീലമിഴി കൊണ്ടു നീ മെല്ലെ മൊഴിയും നിന്നിലൊരു തെന്നല താനെ അലിയും നിതാ അനുരാഗ തീരമെന്നു നീയണോ പ്രിയമോട് താരകങ്ങളെന്നു ചൊല്ലിയോ മിഴി തരാതെ മൊഴി തരാതെ ആരൊരാൾ വന്നു മിഴി തരാതെ മൊഴി തരാതെ ആരൊരാൾ വന്നോ നീലമിഴി കൊണ്ടു നീ മെല്ലെ മൊഴിയുന്നോ നിന്നിലൊരു തെന്നല താനെ അലിയുന്നതാ നീലമിഴി കൊണ്ടു നീ മെല്ലെ 
മൊഴിയുന്നു നീലമിഴി കൊണ്ടു നീ വെല്ലെ മൊഴിയുന്നു ൊരു തന്നല അനുരാഗതീരമെന്നു നീ അണഞ്ഞുവോ യമോട താരകങ്ങളെന്ന് ഡോക്ടർ എബ്രഹാം ജോർജ് ദ ഡയറക്ടർ റിസർച്ച് ഇൻസ്റ്റിറ്റ്യൂട്ട് ഫോർ സസ്റ്റൈനബിൾ ഡെവലപ്മെന്റ് ആൻഡ് ഗവൺമെന്റ് ടു ആൻഡ്രം ഈസ് ദ മോഡറേറ്റർ ഓഫ് ദ ഇവന്റ് സർ ഈസ് സോ ഡിയർ ടു ഈച്ച് വൺ ഓഫ് അസ് അസ് ദ ഫോർമർ പ്രിൻസിപ്പൽ ഓഫ് ദ കോളേജ് ആൻഡ് ഫോർമർ ഹെഡ് ഓഫ് ദ ഡിപ്പാർട്ട്മെന്റ് താങ്ക് യു സർ ഫോർ ബീൻ വിത്ത് അസ് ഡ്യൂറിംഗ് ദിസ് സ്പെഷ്യൽ ഒക്കേഷൻ സർ യു മേ കൈൻഡ്ലി ടേക്ക് യുവർ ടൈം thank you respected principal dr vergis matthew distinguished guest of the day professor prapath patnaik head of the department professor reggie matthew former and present faculty members students and dear friends i am extremely delighted to attend the 25th annual lecture program of department of economics i would like to thank you all particularly professor reggy matthew head of the department and the convener professor anup george for inviting me to this program let me congratulate the department for successfully organizing this year's program despite the constraints due to the covid pandemic it is indeed commendable that you could arrange the annual lecture for 25 years without a break this was achieved through the collective efforts of the faculty and students of our department i gratefully remember the active cooperation and support of my former colleagues in this endeavor during the past 25 years the department could invite several nationally and internationally renowned experts the lecture program was started mainly with the objective of enabling our students to listen to and interact with eminent scholars as such opportunities were quite rare in those days today it is a privilege for me to join you all when one of the most distinguished economists of our country professor prapath patnaik is delivering this year's lecture although i have had the opportunity to hear him speak during several conferences i have attended i still cherish the classes he took when i attended a refresher course program at the jn news academic staff college in early 90s let me express my personal respects and appreciation to professor patnaik an outstanding economist and a great teacher the organizers of this program today have chosen a very relevant topic for the annual lecture growth and poverty under neo liberalism as a moderator i will just introduce that topic very briefly as students of economics most of us are aware that it was the keynesian economics that largely influenced the economic policies during the period between 1930s and 1980s keynesian economics emphasized active role of the government in the economy 
progressive taxation and increased public spending. With the emer emergence of neoliberalism, there occurred a sea change in the macroeconomic thinking and policy making world over. As opposed to Keynesian economics, neoliberal policies stand for reduced role of the government in the economy, lower taxes for the rich, and free play of market forces. The economic policies followed by Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher in the United Kingdom and President Ronald Reagan in the U USA during the 1980s promoted neoliberal po policies in a big way at the global level. The disintegration of Soviet Union, the success stories of the Asian Tigers, and the role of the international financing agencies such as the IMF and the World Bank in aggressively prescribing neoliberal policies to debt-ridden developing countries further strengthened the spread of neoliberalism worldwide. Neoliberal policies primarily aim at faster growth of the national output or GDP, which in turn is expected to trickle down to the poor and the downtrodden. However, after following neoliberal policies during the last three decades, although rapid increase of in GDP has occurred in several countries, it has also led to growing economic inequality in both developing countries and developed countries. And this has aggravated poverty and unemployment in a large number of countries. So in this context, it would be quite appropriate to discuss the various issues related to the growth under neoliberalism. As markets have failed to deliver under the neoliberal scheme of things, what should be the role of the government in making growth more inclusive and sustainable? What are the policy options before us to improve distributive justice in order to ensure that fruits of economic growth are enjoyed by majority of our citizens? Now, let us listen to Professor Prabhat Patnaik, who is the best person to explain to us all such issues related to today's topic, growth and poverty under neoliberalism. Thank you very much. Now we move on to hear from one of the eminent scholars in economics, Professor Dr. Prabhat Patnaik. No words could express his unlimited contribution to the field of economics and to society at large. So it is a great honor and privilege for us to have you for the 25th annual lecture. I humbly invite Professor Prabhat Patnaik to deliver the lecture on the topic growth and poverty under neoliberalism. Thank you very much, Dr. Verghese Matthew, Dr. Abraham George, Dr. A.G. Matthew, Dr. Anup George, other members of the audience. First of all, let me express my deep sense of gratitude that you have invited me to give this lecture the 25th in the series of lectures which the college has been instituting for the last several years. Uh, the topic which I chose is because there is a misconception. The misconception is that even though neoliberalism has increased the rate of growth of the gross domestic product in the economy, and even though it is true that it has been accompanied by an increase in income inequality, income and wealth inequality, an increase in economic inequality. Nonetheless, it has lifted large numbers of people from poverty. And that it is the pandemic which has once more pushed back millions 
into poverty who had been lifted out of poverty because of neoliberalism, because of the neoliberal regime that ushered in a period of rapid GDP growth. In other words, the entire argument that talks about increase in poverty in the recent period concentrates on the pandemic as the cause of this increase in poverty. Now, I believe that's a misconception, and I shall devote my lecture to establishing the point that long before the pandemic, in fact, an accompaniment of neoliberalism was alongside an increase in GDP growth, an increase in absolute poverty as well. It is not only inequality that increased, but there was an increase in absolute poverty as well. Now, the fact that there was a rise in GDP growth rate, you can have discussions, debates about how much was the rise. There are various opinions on this subject, including even Recently, the former chief economic advisor to the government of India, Mr. Arvind Subra, Professor Arvind Subramanian, he himself has questioned the GDP estimates which are currently popular, currently uh, fashionable, currently uh, uh, kind of you know effective in India. But let us accept that notwithstanding all these reservations, there has been a significant increase in the rate of growth of GDP. Now, this rate of growth, again, has slowed down in the recent period, even before the pandemic. There was a slowing down of the rate of growth of GDP. But if you take the period as a whole, from 1991, right until the eve of the pandemic, let's say 19, uh, 1920, uh, in, so, sorry, 201920, then you find that there has been approximately a doubling of the rate of growth of GDP. In the years before, the annual rate of growth of GDP from independence right until the end of the 1980s was perhaps about 3.5 to 4%. And after the introduction of neoliberal policies, this has doubled to about 7 to 8%. This doubling has occurred mainly in the service sector. The service sector has been the leading sector in increasing the growth rate. Not so much agriculture or industry, not the material commodity producing sectors, but the service sector. But with the service sector growth rate rising, there has been, let us say, an approximate doubling of the rate of growth of uh, GDP during period of neoliberalism. But while this has happened, paradoxically and rather surprisingly, you find that there has been an increase in absolute poverty. And I say it in all seriousness, I'll provide some evidence of it. In India, poverty estimates really started around 1973-74. When they started, typically Poverty was defined as whether a person in urban India had access to 2,100 calories per person per day. And in rural India, it was supposed to be 2,400 calories per person per day. But when the estimates were actually made of poverty, that 2,400, for some reason we don't know, was brought down to 2,200. So 2,100 calories in urban India per person per day, 2,200 calories per person per day in rural India was considered the benchmark. If you fell below that in, 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 at any, in, a, in a particular year, then you are considered poor. If you were above that in a particular year, then you are considered to be non-poor. Now, if you take that, in that case, you find that from the National Sample Survey data, from where you can calculate the calorie intake of individuals who are surveyed on the sample survey, then you find 
that in 1993-4, as you know, the National Sample Survey carries out a large sample survey once about every five years. So the first large sample survey after the introduction of neoliberal policies in India in 1991 was carried out in 1993-94. If you take that 1993-94 survey, then you find that in rural India, 58% of the total population was poor on this criteria. That 58% of the total population did not have access to 2200 calories per person per day. In, but if you look at the latest year for which we have NSS data, that's 2011-12. In 2011-12, this percentage had increased to 68%. So there is an increase in the absolute, in, in, the, in, the, in, in the incidence of absolute poverty defined as it has been by the Planning Commission, which is in terms of not having enough calories. If you look at urban India, you find a similar increase from 57% in 1994 to 65% in 2011-12. Therefore, a larger proportion of Indians in the recent period have had less access to uh, calories than in the period immediately after the introduction of neoliberalism. Therefore, by the standard definition of poverty, which the Planning Commission had adopted at that time, there is an increase in the incidence of absolute poverty. When this is, well, two or three things. Firstly, uh, you may say, well, what has been happening after 2011-12? The next sample survey was carried out in 2017-18. And that produced such a dismal picture, you actually found from leaked data that per capita rural expenditure in real terms, per capita in real terms, had gone down by 9% between 2011-12 and 2017-18. Obviously, if, if the average has gone down, then the poor would actually have uh, become the worst victims of it, and therefore the incidence of poverty must have gone up. But the, the findings were so shocking that the government of India decided to suppress them. Those data have not been released, and of course the government is changing the entire methodology of National Sample Survey, which was designed by none, none other than Professor P. C. Mahalanobis, who was India's great statistician, uh, and, 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 and the first vice chairman of the, I mean, first deputy chairman of the planning commission, the Jawaharlal Nehru. So the point is that, that after 2011, things have certainly not been better. If anything, they have actually continued to deteriorate, perhaps at a very rapid pace. The second question is when some people then say that, look, okay, but the fact that calorie intake has gone down is something that need not worry us because maybe people are diversifying. Maybe people are now more keen on sending their children to school, therefore incur a larger proportion of expenditure on education, more keen on having access to modern healthcare, therefore spend more on, 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 on medical expenses, on hospitalization and so on. And to offset this increase, they may be cutting down on their food consumption. Therefore, there's nothing to worry about. This is actually a change in tastes that is taking place, not, uh, in fact, any sign of a deprivation. As a matter of fact, if you look at data all over the world, all over the world, whether it is time series data, cross-section data, mixed data, then you find that all over the world, when per capita real income rises, per capita calorie intake also rises, 
at least at this level, when you are very well off, when you are having enormous numbers of calories, you may decide to become health conscious and bring down your calorie intake. But that's not at this level we are talking about. At this level, there is no doubt that all over the world, whenever per capita real income rises, per capita calorie intake also rises. Therefore, there is no question of a change in taste. If it is the case that it is not rising, that's because of the fact that there is privatization of healthcare, privatization of education, which actually increases the cost of accessing the same amount of healthcare, the same amount of education. Uh, the, the cost of accessing those services has gone up because of which the people are forced to cut back on their consumption. It's not a change in taste. It is, in fact, an increase in poverty and increase in deprivation because of the rise in prices of these services. Therefore, there is no question that this poverty, as defined strictly by the government of India itself, not my definition of poverty, has actually been increasing over the entire period of neoliberal reforms. Now, it's another thing that during the pandemic, a bad situation or a worsening situation has become much worse. Obviously, we know that during the pandemic, things have become much worse in other countries. Say in the United States, they did two things during the pandemic. One is that nobody was allowed to evict any tenant for non-payment of rent during the period of lockdown. During the period of lockdown, people had no income, therefore they could not pay rents. But there was a moratorium on evicting anybody for non-payment of rent. The second thing they did is that because there was a loss of incomes of the people, the government provided incomes to everybody, that there was a certain minimum amount which was handed over to everybody. And this happened in the United States because of which the total transfers to the people during the pandemic rescue come relief package amounted to 10% of the US GDP. And this, in the era of Donald Trump, who's not known to be a particularly progressive uh, person or a, or, a, or a particularly sympathetic person to the poor, but you found that even under Donald Trump, the rescue come relief package was 10% of GDP, and this is something which was also accompanied by these measures I'm talking about. What happened in India is that there was no such moratorium on evictions because of which we have seen hundreds of thousands of people were thrown out of the places of residence where they had occupied for a very long time and were marching on the roads in order to get back to their villages, walking hundreds of kilometers because they had nowhere, they had nowhere else to go. The second thing is that even when many of them lost their livelihoods, lost their incomes, lost their occupations, there was nothing which was provided by the government except to a few target groups. There was no universal assistance provided to everybody who had experienced the loss of incomes and therefore they were completely destituted. Because of which the total relief package in India during the pandemic came to only about 1% of GDP. In the United States, remember, it was 10% of GDP. Of course, to camouflage this meager handout, then the government generally uh, kind of some of the existing schemes and so on, they put together as relief and rehabilitation package. But that's just window dressing. Fundamentally, that in India, the transfers to the poor during the pandemic were trivial because of which there was a massive increase in poverty. But even if you do not consider that, which of course accentuated a situation already very bad, nonetheless, what you do find is that throughout the period of neoliberal reforms, you had a worsening of poverty. The proportion of population being that can be considered poor, even by the government's own definition, 
was increasing in the period after the introduction of neoliberal reforms. And the question is why? Why is it that in a period in which the growth rate of the economy has virtually doubled, you actually had a worsening of the uh, proportion of poor in the population. In order to get to that, well, okay, one thing which is very clear is that I was referring to the reduced calorie intake, which arises because of the reduced food grain intake. When I say food grain, I don't mean directly food grain. I mean food grain directly and indirectly in the form of processed food, in the form of, uh, uh, you know, uh, food products. I mean, if I have a biscuit, then, then of course I'm, in, I'm, I'm ingesting food grains indirectly. While, of course, if I have rice, I'm ingesting food grains directly. So if you take both direct and indirect, the total ingestion of food grains per capita has, of course, gone down because of which the calorie intake has gone down. But why has it gone down? Let me just give you some historic figure, historical figures. At the beginning of the 20th century, around 1900, the per capita annual food grain intake in what was then called British India, that is British ruled India, was about 200 kilograms per year, per person per year. This experienced a disastrous fall so that right on the eve of independence, if you take 1946-47, it was 138 kilograms. That's an enormous drop. After independence, with great difficulty, an effort was made to reverse this decline, so that by the end of the 1980s, it had come up to about 180 kilograms annually per person still less than at the beginning of the 20th century compared to, let's say, 1900. By 1980 end, it was still less, 200 to 180. But on the other hand, it had actually, the decline had been reversed. If you take the neoliberal period, then even by the very recent 2016-17 data show that it continues to remain, maybe marginally less, around roughly, let us say, 180 kilograms per person per year. In other words, during the entire neoliberal period, there has been no increase in per capita food grain absorption in India. Now, while per capita food grain absorption, which is defined simply as production, net production plus net imports minus net addition to stocks, while this has more or less remained stable, a lot of the food grains now are really utilized for producing other kinds of things, for, 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 for producing, for instance, biofuels. Biofuel production has gone up everywhere. So food grain is diverted towards biofuel production and food grain, of course, is diverted towards processed food production, which is consumed by the rich. But at the same time, you find that really enormous additions to food grain stocks are with the government. 90 million tons of food grain stocks are lying around with the government while the stocks that are required by the government are about 25 million tons. So the reason why there has been a decline, I mean, there has been a rise in poverty, a decline in nutritional intake, is not because of the lack of supplies. Lack of supplies, I told you, is there. In other words, really speaking, even per capita food grain that is available for Human consumption has, of course, gone down. But the purchasing power in the hands of the people has gone down even more sharply because of which the amount that is left with the government, uh, with the Food Corporation of India, has really increased greatly. It is this decline in purchase per capita real purchasing power in the hands of the people that we have to concentrate on if we are going to find an explanation of why poverty 
has increased during the period when growth rate has actually doubled. Why is it that when growth rate increases, doubles, you actually have reduced per capita purchasing power in the hands of vast numbers of people? Look at this. I want you to uh, just look at one identity in economics. You know, identity is something which is trivially true. I mean, it's absolutely by definition true. The rate of growth of employment is nothing else but the rate of growth of output minus the rate of growth of labor productivity. Strictly speaking, any of you who are mathematically inclined would know that this is true with continuous time, but it is approximately true even with discrete time if you're talking on annual data. Now, the reason why during this period, not enough purchasing power has come to the people's hands is because even though there has been a very sharp increase in GDP growth rate, there has also been a very sharp increase in the rate of growth of labor productivity, because of which the employment growth rate has actually slowed down. Now, let me just give you some figures, you know, that you find that during the period, let's say from independence, right, until the end of the 1980s, I said the, the GDP growth rate was approximately three and a half to four percent per annum. Employment growth rate during this period was roughly speaking about, uh, you know, I mean, it, it, Employment growth rate during this period was roughly speaking about one and a half to two percent per annum. Uh, sorry, labor productivity growth rate was about one and a half to two percent per annum because of which employment growth rate, one minus the other, was roughly about two percent, which was roughly the same as the rate of growth of the population, therefore, the rate of growth of the workforce. Therefore, what happened was that the increase in population was getting absorbed into employment, but the backlog of unemployment, which had got built up by the beginning of our planning period, continued to grow at, at the rate of 2%. You know, that, that if you find workforce is growing at 2%, employment is growing at 2%. In that case, the unemployment is also growing at 2%. So the backlog of unemployment continued to grow. Now what you have is that even though there is a doubling of the GDP growth rate. There is a halving of employment growth rate compared to the pre-1990s period. That the rate of growth of employment is actually half of what it used to be before. Therefore, it's about 1%, one percent, one to one and a half percent, which is less than the rate of growth of the population growth. Therefore, unemployment is growing even more rapidly than employment is growing. And to the extent this is happening, obviously you find that purchasing power is not growing rapidly enough. Why is this happening? Why, is, why has employment growth come down? Employment growth has come down because we go back to the identity I was talking about because labor productivity growth has been extremely high. That neoliberalism, while it has brought about a rapid rate of growth of GDP, much faster than before, has also brought about a rapid rate of growth of labor productivity. Now, if so, then the difference between the two is actually less now than it was earlier. That means the rate of growth of employment has actually halved compared to what it was before. The question therefore, by the way, this is a very simple point, but this point is not at all understood by a lot of people. As a matter of fact, you often find that, that you know, our political leaders say, oh yes, we must increase the rate of growth of labor productivity, that in order to be able to compete, in order to be able to be a successful economic power, we must increase the rate of growth of labor productivity. What they don't realize is that such an increase in the rate of labor productivity simultaneously diminishes for any given GDP growth rate, the rate of growth of employment actually makes people poor. That a rate of growth of labor productivity 
far from making the country powerful, actually makes the bulk of the people poorer because it really curtails the ability of the government of, of the economy to generate jobs. This was a point, oddly enough, that Gandhiji understood, which is why Gandhiji was in favor of having constraints, having limitations on the rate of growth of labor productivity. Uh, but this is a point that many contemporary uh, political leaders, contemporary um, spokesmen, contemporary experts and so on, do not adequately understand. Why has the rate of growth of labor productivity increased in the neoliberal period? Well, there are two reasons. The first is that suppose now the economy is open. If the, if the economy is open, it is open to competition. Chinese goods can come in, uh, Western goods can come in, and so on. It is not only that we have to remain competitive for undertaking exports. Even in our domestic economy, we have to remain competitive in order to be able to stand our ground vis-a-vis -vis imports from all kinds of countries. Now, during this competitive struggle, therefore, there is an effort to make your products cheap and making your product relative to other countries' products and making your products cheap, one obvious way is to increase labor productivity. Okay? Now, if you increase labor productivity, so there's a competitive pressure to increase labor productivity, which is a hallmark of an open economy that is open to competition, for, of, of, of imports from other countries. That's one very obvious reason why there has been an increase in the rate of growth of labor productivity. The other reason is really a rather more subtle reason. And let me just try and explain this to you. Suppose it is the case that we have a lot of labor reserves, we have a lot of unemployment, because of which our wage rate, real wage rate, is at some kind of a subsistence level. Our trade unions are weak, they can't really, and in any case, only about 4% of the total workforce is unionized, so they can't really increase the real wage rate of workers at large. Okay. Therefore, and we have huge unemployment, therefore real wages, until that backlog of unemployment is used up, until we have a tight labor market, you find that real wages are not going to increase much. As a matter of fact, they have not increased much if you compare late 1980s till today, real, I mean, till even the eve of the pandemic, forget about now, then you find that real wages have marginally even fallen. They have certainly not increased. Okay, now, therefore, in order for real wages to increase, it is necessary that the labor reserves get used up. It is necessary that there has to be some tightening of the labor market. Now, some, this tightening, suppose it is the case that there is no such tightening. Okay, suppose it is the case that labor reserves continue, even if they're getting used up, they take a long time to, to get used up and suppose during that period, real wages remain at the subsistence level. Then you find, however, labor productivity is rising. If labor productivity rises while real wages remain at a subsistence level, then of course it means that the economic surplus as a proportion of, of, of GDP rises. Economic surplus rises. It, economic surplus includes many things. It includes property incomes, profits, rents, um, uh, landlords' incomes, and so on and so forth. It also includes the incomes of a large number of people. Let us say corporate lawyers, advertisement agencies, and so on, all of whom are, let's say, employed by corporate capital in various capacities. So if you take the totality of that income, that is what comes out of the economic surplus, something which is produced by the workers or by the working people, but really does not accrue to them. Now, if you look at these people, they naturally are influenced by consumption patterns 
which prevail internationally, consumption pattern which prevail in rich countries. And therefore, if more income goes to them, their consumption shifts in favor of all kinds of goods which prevail internationally, which prevail in the advanced countries. And these goods typically are not at all employment intensive. Let me give you an example. When I used to work in Kerala, uh, there are lots of people, you know, we had just started this uh, Mahatma Gandhi, MGNREGS, Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme. When we started the MGNREGS scheme, we used to go from village to village to find out how exactly the scheme is working. So I would often ask people who were really doing the labor manual work on the scheme, uh, have you got your wage? They would say yes. So I would ask, what have you spent it on? So many of them would say, you know, we have spent it on buying that, those, that stone grinder with which the dosa mix is made. Now, that stone grinder is something which is available in the village or available in the next village and so on. So the multiplier effect, the demand generating effect of the MDNREGS was really felt on true commodities like the stone grinder, which really generated a lot of employment. By contrast, Suppose you take that rupee from such a person and give it to somebody who's employed in New Delhi. In that case, that person would use the rupee. Partly that person is going to save more of the rupee. And secondly, to the extent the person spends, would spend, let us say, in taking a trip abroad. Maybe some brother is, is in the United States, might go to visit him and so on. Therefore, you'd find that the employment generic domestic employment generating effect of that rupee which is taken from the rural laborer in kerala and handed to a well-off person in delhi would be negative that actually it will employ less employment it will generate less employment now therefore a shift from the wage income to surplus income has exactly the same effect it actually tends to generate less employment and therefore it tends to actually give rise to larger labor productivity. After all, when we see, for instance, that, you know, I mean, in, in, in the village, you don't have malls. In the village, what you have is the local shop. But on the other hand, you come to the city, you have these malls and a mall employs many, much fewer people than... Uh, uh, a, a, a village company. Therefore, hello. What is happening? Hello. Yes, yeah. sir. Uh, yeah. Okay. The, the, therefore, you find that the labor productivity rises because of the change in income distribution. As income distribution becomes unequal, of which the rise in the share of surplus is a very obvious index, then you find that the labor productivity rises because the goods that the rich demand are much less employment intensive than the goods that the poor people demand because of which there is such a shift in income distribution gives rise to a shift in demand, which gives rise to a shift in the kind of goods which, which are made available. And therefore you find that there is a reduction in employment that takes place. Therefore, these two reasons. Firstly, that there is, because of competitive pressure, there is a pressure to introduce greater labor productivity and therefore reduction in employment. And secondly, as, 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 as a means of cheapening commodities, and secondly, because of the shift in the pattern of demand, shift in the pattern of consumption, there is, uh, again, a kind of you know, employment reducing effect. If you put these two, then it's not very surprising that the, that the shift from the earlier period, when the growth rate of GDP was low, to the more recent period, when the growth rate of GDP is high, the shift has been accompanied by a fall in the rate of growth of, of, of employment. And this fall in the rate of growth of employment actually is now giving rise to an increase in the labor reserves as a proportion of 
the total workforce. In other words, a larger proportion of the total workforce is now unemployed than was the case earlier. But of course, in India, you don't have workers who are either fully employed or fully unemployed. That is what you find in the West, that, you know, some people have jobs, other people have no jobs. What you typically have here is really employment rationing. That suppose you find that, let us say, 10 people are looking for jobs uh, which can employ only five, then it is not that only five people are employed and five remain unemployed, but the 10 are really employed for half the time. And this is the effect of casualization. When you find casualization is taking place, that basically means that some days I manage to get a job, on other days I don't. Every morning I go looking for jobs, I sometimes get a job, sometimes don't get a job. Therefore, this employment ration. Therefore, this unemployment really, this growing unemployment in the proportion of the workforce really manifests itself in terms of a reduction in real income per capita. This reduction in real income per capita therefore gives rise to a reduction in purchasing, real purchasing power per capita, and therefore it gives rise to greater malnutrition and therefore greater poverty. Now, in the light of this, what can one say then? You know, I mean, okay, if if this is and this is going to be, you know, as as economic, as long as unemployment persists, as long as you have labor reserves not getting used up. In fact, as I said, labor reserves are increasing over a period of time relative to the workforce. So wages are not going to rise. The incomes of the poor are not going to increase. Rather, the incomes of the poor are going to decline. And if the incomes of the poor decline or do not increase, but labor productivity continues to rise, then inequality would continue to rise. And of course, if inequality continues to rise, then there is a further increase in labor product, rate of growth of labor productivity. Therefore, even less chance of the unemployed getting jobs less chance for an eradication of poverty. Now, if this is the case, then what can one do about it? Obviously, what is required is an alternative economic strategy, an alternative economic strategy that does not have to keep raising labor productivity as a part of being competitive. What would such an alternative economic strategy mean? Such an alternative economic strategy, of course, would mean that we'll have to protect ourselves against cheaper imports. If it is the case that those cheaper imports are actually going to displace domestic employment. In fact, now you find large amounts of Chinese imports coming in and displacing domestic employment. I don't think that is something which should be encouraged. Large amount of other countries' imports coming in, that should not be encouraged. I believe the one we have to prioritize full employment in our own economy. And for this, if it is necessary for us to protect ourselves, we should protect ourselves. But that is not enough. In other words, I mentioned that there is a change in the pattern of demand that is taking place. And for that pattern of demand, you have to make sure that that change in the pattern of demand does not take place. Therefore, you have to have a much more egalitarian distribution of income. How can you do that? Let me just give you one very simple way that, that, that we can do that. Now, you must have read in newspapers. Now, Oxfam has come out with a report and so on that wealth inequality in India has increased dramatically. Not only in India, in every country of the world, but in India particularly, it has increased dramatically during the pandemic, but even before the pandemic. Wealth and income inequalities have increased dramatically. Now, if so, then one way in which we can actually introduce more egalitarian policies is for the government, let us say, to take a hundred rupees from the rich through income or wealth taxation. I would prefer wealth taxation because we don't have a wealth tax in India. 
It is amazing that in India there is no wealth tax, while in advanced capitalist countries there are suggestions of really raising the wealth tax rates. Take a hundred rupees in the form of wealth taxation from the rich, use those hundred rupees in providing free health care to the poor, free health care to every citizen, why only the poor, free health care for every citizen, free education for every citizen, so that these services, which have been getting privatized and therefore made much more expensive, are now really provided free for every citizen. And if that is the case, then you would find that this would release purchasing power. You see now, if, if I was spending 100 rupees sending my child to school and now I don't have to spend those 100 rupees and I have 100 rupees left in my pocket with which I can then go and buy enough food rates. Therefore, this whole idea of bringing about an improvement in the income distribution of the country is an essential condition. I, 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 I began by saying that in many cases, this would actually involve protecting domestic industry against outside competition. But additionally, what it requires is an increase in income, in, income equality, and that can happen with taxing the rich in order to provide services to the poor, in order to provide education services, in order to provide healthcare services uh, to the poor. Now, you may say that, look, where, you know, can we really tax? Of course we can. As a matter of fact, I made a calculation uh, which would show the following. That if you have, if you, if you take the top 1% of the population, 1%, put a 2% wealth tax on that top 1% of the population. In other words, suppose I belong to the top 1% and I have a wealth of 1,000 rupees. In that case, simply take 20 rupees out of my health, my, 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 my wealth. So you take a 2% wealth tax imposed on the top 1% of the population. But of course, the moment you impose this wealth tax, what I would do is that I would divide up my wealth among my children. Therefore, this wealth tax has to be supplemented by an inheritance tax that actually you have to kind of, you know, put taxes on dividing up the wealth among children. And that inheritance tax in all advanced capitalist countries is pretty high. But in India, let us take only 33% inheritance tax on the top 1% of the population. All taxes I'm talking about are only on the top 1% of the population. 2% wealth tax, 33%, one third that is inheritance tax. The amount of money you'd get is quite enough to finance not just free healthcare and free education, but to finance five fundamental economic rights. One is right to food, universal right to food. The other is right to employment in the sense that, that, you know, either you provide employment or if you can't provide employment, provide a wage to all these people, uh, like MDNRE GSP visualizes for rural uh, India. Uh, so right to food, right to employment, right to free quality health care through uh, uh, a national health service right to free quality education through government-run institutions and right to old age pension and disability benefits, non-contributory for everybody. And of course, this is something, you know, you'd be amazed to know what the current government's pension is. 200 rupees per month. It's a joke. It's ridiculous. Now that has to be raised to at least about 3,000 rupees. If you provide that, then all of it can be financed with a 2% wealth tax and a one-third inheritance tax imposed only on the top 1% of the population. Now, mind you, 2% wealth tax is really nothing. During the American presidential elections, Bernie Sanders had suggested a uh, Two I mean, he had actually suggested a progressive wealth tax going from 1% to 7%. Similarly, another contender, Elizabeth Warren, had suggested a 1% wealth tax for the 
for, for, for the relatively less wealthy and a 2% wealth tax for the relatively more wealthy. So 2% wealth tax is something which others are also thinking about. And everybody I know, for instance, the French economist Piketty, who has been working on inequality and so on, he was amazed that India had no wealth tax. So, so it is. It is really shocking that we do not make efforts to build an egalitarian society, which is anti-democratic. Democracy cannot survive in a society which is so unequal. It is shocking because people do not actually have uh, the basic access to calories. And therefore, so many years after the independence, if people still do not have basic access to calories, then this, of course, has got, as I said, compounded by the uh, uh, you know um, neoliberal policies. But then I think it's a shocking state of affairs. And the more we raise our voice against this shocking state of affairs as economists, the more significant would be our social role. In other words, being economist does not only mean doing some kind of, you know, mathematical formulae or something or, or doing just some, some basic, uh, uh, you know, economic theory, but it is something which must make us public intellectuals demanding an economy in which we have eradicated poverty. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for insightful words and thought. Now it's time for discussion. Participants can raise any questions. Thank, Thank you, Professor Prabhat Patnaik, for your wonderful presentation. We got very informative insights uh, from your talk. And we understand from your talk that in spite of the fact that GDP has been increasing, there is a rapid increase in, at the, in the poverty levels um, as well. And the, due to the neoliberal policies pursued by the government and there's a lots of privatization in education and health sectors are, are taking place. And increase in the poverty and unemployment has worsened due to the impact of the pandemic because there's, there, there's a large scale loss of livelihoods, jobs and um, sources of income for uh, our people. And it, I, 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 it is very interesting to know that even after 100 years, our per capita food grain intake um, has, has not uh, risen to the old level. And that is, uh, that is a very interesting piece of uh, information. Um, similarly, um, you also said that uh, in their pursuit to remain uh, competitive, Producers are um, getting, uh, making, um, or increasing labor productivity, and that is also leading to uh, unemployment. Uh, I found that information also very, very, very uh, interesting. And um, we need to have, as you suggested, um, that we need to have an alternative economic uh, strategy. Um, and uh, uh, you, you are uh, talking against the uh, imports of uh, cheap products from uh, countries like uh, China. And uh, how far should we go in, in that direction? Because uh, we, we, sh we, we should be more following more protective policies um, in the uh, external front. And uh, how far this is possible uh, under our commitments with the uh, WTO. Uh, I hope when you uh, explain the, towards the end of the discussion, uh, you will touch upon that area also. And um, 
as a leading economist of the country, I am sure that your suggestion for progressive taxation and wealth taxes and inheritance tax at the same time that will go a long way in reducing the growing increase, growing inequality in the income and wealth. Uh, in, in our country. Uh, thank you, sir. It, it was a very interesting session and it, it, it was a pleasure to listen to your wonderful talk uh, after, after some time. And, and now um, the floor is open for discussion. Um, and as we have very limited time, ask your questions or make your comments uh, briefly. Um, Professor Anup George will uh, manage the uh, discussion uh, session. So uh, I Thank hope you. all of you will participate actively in the discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for patient listening. Uh, it's time for discussion. So please put up your queries and questions. Uh, we can have a discussion. Yes, sir, can I make a question? A couple of questions. Yes, yes sir. This is the event. Uh, yes, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, sir, I listened to your talk and uh, I got a several uh, valuable information from your talk. Uh, I have two questions. One is regarding the labor productivity. Uh, so you told that uh, the increase in labor productivity is one of the important reasons for the declining uh, employment. So how is it possible to uh, give a ceiling or uh, set an upper limit for the increasing labor productivity in the technology driven modern era, especially after the uh, reforms. That's my first doubt. And the other one is, uh, sir, can you please comment on the role of public distribution system in the current scenario when you said that there is more than 90 million tons of uh, buffer stock with the government in the food grains. So uh, how should uh, we uh, improve our public distribution system? in order to make the distribution of food grains more equitable. That's uh, another doubt. And I had another question which uh, our moderator had already asked, Abraham Joseph has already asked that is regarding the WTO restrictions, uh, which restricts us to uh, control imports. So uh, these are my questions. So, shall I, shall I take all questions at, at one go? That will probably save time. Sure, sir, we'll do that. Yeah. So others can raise questions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir, I am Vivek from 30th Economics from mm -hmm. College. Sir, I have one question. Sir, yes. is, me is measurement of poverty based on the amount of calorie intake appropriate? Like, if inequality causes stress and anxiety, then the inequality may induce anxiety triggering increased food consumption. Mm -hmm. uh, that's based on the assumption hypothesis that. Uh, Stress is associated with increased pursuit uh, of, of food and consumption. Uh, or when food scarcity is pursued or anticipated, it increases food intake. So is it, is it appropriate to measure poverty on the basis of calorie intake? Okay. Is there any other question? So I think you can answer it now. Is that all? Shall I start? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. Uh, very. So thank you for the question. Very, very interesting questions. Uh, first, of course, uh, uh, Professor Abraham George's question. Uh, you know, I am not for protection as such. I'm not saying that a country should protect itself. No, not, not at all. I'm for full employment. For full employment, we need a package of policies. One such package, one element of this package I have talked about is more equal distribution of income and wealth. The other is that even if you have more equal distribution of income and wealth, and then at the end of it, you also find that there is uh, that the, the, the effect 
of this, okay, the effect of this equal distribution of income and wealth would be that there'd be a change in the consumption pattern, that there would be demand for more labor intensive goods compared to what is happening now. But suppose this demand for more labor intensive goods that has been brought about is leaking out to China or to or to or to some other country or or or, or, or is leaking out even to the advanced countries. Suppose that happens. In that case, it would be necessary for us to introduce protection. Now, this introduction of protection, therefore, is not something I'm prioritizing. It is something which, to the extent it is necessary, we should have. Now, I should just say one thing, that in a lot of our commodities, really speaking, our rates of, our tariff rates, are lower than what is permitted by the WTO. When we had quantitative restrictions and the quantitative restrictions went at the beginning of this century, then the, I, the WTO allows what are called tariff bounds. That, okay, you have removed the quantitative restriction on imports, but you're allowed to impose tariffs up to, let's say, 80% or whatever. Now, that 80% is called a tariff bound. Now, in most cases, the tariffs we have are below the tariff bounds. Therefore, it would not even necessarily have to meet the, incur the wrath of the WTO. So, so, so we don't even have to worry about that. But I do find it's very strange that, you know, in the old days when I was a kid, you know, all these, on Diwali, on Diwali you had, earthen lamps produced in the village itself, which were available to everybody. But now you have Diwali lights coming from China. Therefore, what has happened to those poor fellows who are doing earthen lamps? So I think it, it becomes important either for we could retrain them. We could, in fact, teach them how to make earthen lamps. But fundamentally, they must not be allowed to become unemployed. You know, Gandhiji had said it. Gandhiji had said that, why should I buy the latest fashionable products from Savile Row in London, if in the process of my doing so, I find that my brother, the weaver in the next village, is going to become unemployed. I think that is a consideration we must all have in mind. I, therefore, I prioritize full employment, not protection as such. Protection to the extent necessary for achieving full employment. Okay, then the next question Two things, two questions. One was labor productivity. Uh, why should we, uh, you know, I mean, how can we prevent labor productivity uh, <clears throat> from rising if it is the case that we actually, uh, you know, I mean, modern age, and so on. Fine, I, I, I agree. I'm not for a moment saying that we should have primitive methods across the, uh, across the spectrum. But I'm saying let's not modernize across the spectrum. Now, for instance, I'm not saying that instead of the latest surgery, instead of, let us say, laser-guided surgery, we should, in fact, go back to what was pre pre prevalent 100 years, 200 years ago. But the point is that why we have to have, in other words, a spectrum of technologies. Some technologies are absolutely essential. Yes, of course, the benefits of modern technology must accrue to all of us. But on the other hand, not everything is necessarily uh, uh, technologically required. A mall, for instance, I mean, after all, we all have been uh, we all have been agitating against malls on the ground that when you have a mall, in that case, that displaces so many people. Okay, who, who, who had little, uh, tiny little shops. Now, I don't see the necessity. In some cases, it may not displace. Okay, by all means, let's have a mall then. But the point is that in areas where you can see that it displaces a whole lot of, 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 of tiny shopkeepers, then I don't see why we should have malls. So we have to have a spectrum of technologies. Now what is happening is that, that we, we are really talking about modern technology across the spectrum. There's no control on technological progress, technological change. I'm opposed to that. Because as I said, I prioritize full employment. 
Okay, then the second was the PDS, uh, 90 mil million tons of there. You know, there is, it's, it's an amazing story. Just imagine the 90 million tons of grains which are there are with the uh, Food Corporation of India. Suppose the government spent a hundred rupees, let us say, suppose the government handed over a hundred rupees to a poor person. This poor person would go and spend the hundred rupees, let us say, in buying food grains. Then those hundred rupees which the poor person spends would come to the Food Corporation of India that would hand over through the rationing system hundred rupees worth of grain. So what the government's right hand has spent would come to the government's left hand because Food Corporation of India is a part of the government. But this would show itself in the budget because FCI's accounts are separate from the government's account as deficit financing on the part of the government, as a fiscal deficit. It's really not meaningfully a fiscal deficit in terms of elementary economics, it's not a fiscal deficit. As a matter of fact, when I was a student, in fact, even later, when I was doing my PhD thesis, the FCI's accounts were part of the budget. The FCI was not a separate entity. Therefore, this is a purely accounting process. And because of this accounting process, if the government actually spends more in the form of transfers, which are handed over to people who then spend it on food, that is really not a fiscal deficit, but it would appear as fiscal deficit. And because we have a law, that actually prevents, you know, FRBM, Fiscal Responsibility and Budgetary Management Act. Because of that, we our fiscal deficit will be larger and, and then so on and so forth. So, so, so to control the fiscal deficit, we actually don't even uh, get rid of our four food grain stocks. So we have surplus food grain stocks lying around with at extreme hunger, you must have all seen the hunger index where India is 102 out of 111 countries. So what is the point of having 8% GDP growth rate if you're 102 among 111 countries in terms of the hunger index in the world? So the point is that we remain in 102 position or thereabouts mm. for the simple reason that we are, 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 are caught in this peculiar metaphysical, mystical accounting procedure where uh, even though something is not a fiscal deficit because it will show itself to a fiscal deficit, we don't uh, spend enough in handing over money to people who can then buy food. Okay. Then there's a question on uh, measurement of poverty. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, may, uh, yeah, okay, yeah, sure. I remember now. Huh? The, the question is on the measurement of poverty. Why should we take food or anything? Don't. What is essential is that take any essential commodity. If that commodity is correlated with the rise, I mean, if the, if, if the intake of that commodity is correlated with the rise in the level of real income, or if you like, if the income elasticity of demand for that commodity is positive, that's all I'm saying, positive. In that case, that commodity can act as a proxy for real income changes. So if you find that Food grain is a very obvious thing, certainly at our kinds of levels of income. I told you, international data show that whenever real income rises per capita, food grain consumption rises per capita, calorie intake rises per capita. So that is why originally it was taken as the indicator of poverty. So, so all that is required for a commodity to qualify as an indicator of poverty is that there must be a positive income elasticity of demand for that commodity. As income rises, the demand for that commodity must rise and food grain qualifies for that. Therefore, uh, there is every reason to take food grains as an indicator of poverty. And, and, and what is more, we know that it is very important and hunger is very important, okay? So, so that's why, thank you. Uh, so we have one more question, shall we? Yes, please. 
sir uh, sir when we consider the indian economic scenario nowadays are the increasing privatization policies in the indian economy in any way driving the country's economy into poverty okay you, you, you know i was talking about greater taxation wealth taxation and so on and so forth what this what the government has been doing is just the opposite the government has actually given away huge amounts of corporate income tax concessions why in order to attract capital now now one thing which the government does not realize which every economist knows is that businessmen invest when they expect the market to increase okay suppose you double the businessman's profits it, it doesn't mean they are going to invest they may put that money in the bank they may they they may just kind of you know use that money for going and having a holiday on the french riviera but they would invest only when they expect that the market is going to grow otherwise what happens they have a certain capacity that capacity can produce enough to meet my current market okay my current demand is 100 rupees i mean 100 rupees worth of goods and my current capacity can let us say produce 110 rupees worth of goods and 20 rupees worth of goods in that case why should i make extra investment i just be holding on to unused capacity and unused capacity gives me nothing therefore the private investment has to depend upon the rate of growth of the market it has to depend upon of which you can take various and uh, different investment functions take different proxies you can take capacity utilization as a proxy you can accelerator theory takes the expected growth of the market as a proxy for which the current growth of the market is is, is then taken as an indicator and so on but whatever the specific investment function that fundamental mentally more investment can occur only when the market is growing but if the market is not growing handing over more money simply does not help in boosting investment now our governments have till now been under i mean neoliberal policy has been under the illusion that if you give more money to the businessmen then they make more investment that is not the case which is why our inequalities have been growing and we do not use the tax mechanism in order to uh, rectify it so one last question yes can yes. give can giving agriculture more uh, importance and shifting focus back to agriculture and agriculture related industries with more labor intensive techniques solve the problem of the huge reserve of labor yes of course it will in fact what i am suggesting is precisely you know the next step would be that suppose it is the case that you reduce income inequalities if you reduce income inequalities then food grain as, as i said one of the thing that would happen is that the demand for food grains would rise when the demand for food grains rise they rises initially you can use the stocks available with the fci to, to meet that demand but fairly soon you run out of stocks and if demand rises further as it must because after all our levels of consumption are extraordinarily low bangladesh has much higher level of per capita consumption of food grains than india has hey, by the way every south asian country pakistan bangladesh nepal they all have higher levels of per capita food grain consumption than we have so the, the the when the stocks kind of get used up then you need to produce more so if you pursue a more egalitarian more pro people policy then accordingly you would also have to have a different pattern of output being generated agriculture would necessarily have to be given greater importance in such a scenario thank you thank you sir and thank you all for raising the questions over to your round sir thank you sir and it was a wonderful experience for each one of us to listen to your wonderful presentation we are grateful to you uh, for your excellent lecture and also for providing answers to our doubts uh, in the most lucid manner so uh, we are very much uh, grateful to you uh, and uh, as the moderator uh, i would like to thank uh, professor prabhat patnaik and 
uh, all those people who participated in the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Before we wind up the session, let's hear from George Thomas a melodious song. <laughs> Nilamiri kundu ni melle muri ko ninniloru tennala aane alin nida. Nilamiri kundu ni melle muri ko. Nilluru thennala, thane ali unnida. Anuraga thira minnu niyanandu go. Priya mode taragandu chelliyo. Piri tarade, mori tarade, arurar vandu. Vidhitarade, Vidhitarade, Aruralvam. Nila miri kundu ni, Mille muri unnu. Ninni luru tennala, Nane ali unnida. George. Now I invite Mr. Arvin Shankar N, Assistant Professor of the Department, to propose word of thanks. Honorable Chief Guest of the Program, Professor Prabhat Patnaik, Respected Moderator of the Session, Dr. Abraham Varghese, Respected Principal of the College, Dr. Varghese Matthew, Head of the Department, Professor Reggie Matthew, Former Teachers of the Department, Mr. Scholars, my dear colleagues and my dear students. We have come to the concluding moments of the Silver Jubilee edition of the annual lecture of the Department of Economics, Marthama College, Tiruvalla. It is indeed joyful that the program has been a success so far. Now it is time to express the formal vote of thanks. The highest point of success of this program is that the 25th annual lecture was delivered by Professor Prabhat Patnaik, one of the most renowned economists in the Indian academic and political scenario. 
in spite of his busy schedule he accepted our invitation and delivered this ever memorable lecture on growth and poverty under neoliberalism in the name of the college and the department i extend our deepest gratitude to professor prabhat patnaik for devoting his precious time for making the silver jubilee edition of the annual lecture a successful academic endeavor thank you sir for moderating such a great session by a renowned economist none other than an expert in the field of economics like dr abraham george could be imagined the department is deeply indebted to to him for his remarkable contributions to the institution and the department both during his service and after his official retirement in the name of the college and the economics association i express our sincere gratitude to dr abraham george whose presence enriched this academic session thank you sir our dearest and most respected principal dr vargis matthew has always encouraged the activities of the department he is making his best efforts to take the institution to new heights in the name of the department i extend my sincere thanks to dr vargis matthew our beloved principal for his wholehearted support to this program thank you sir this annual lecture which is celebrating its quarter century today is a brainchild of our former teachers the great visionaries among our former teachers have been leading us in the right direction for academic progress in the name of the college and the economics association i thank all the former teachers who accepted our invitation and participated in this program i also take this opportunity to express our sincere thanks to all the research scholars who participated in this program i would also like to express our gratitude to the department of sacred music and communications dsmc tiruvella for offering their valuable technical support to this program in the name of the economics association i thank all my colleagues and my students whose participation made this program purposeful and successful once again thanking you all wish you a good time thank you all for being with us on this special occasion thank you